This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. On September 23rd, 1955, Dwight D. Eisenhower's press secretary addresses the media about an important development involving the U.S. president's health. All right, everyone, quiet, please. I know you're all anxious for this update. Is it true the president went to the hospital? Yes, yes, it's true. Nothing to worry about. President Eisenhower just had a hamburger that didn't agree with him. Did somebody put a spicy sauce on it? No, but I can confirm there are pickles and a slice of cheddar cheese. Wouldn't that make it a cheeseburger? Uh, yeah, I, yep, I, I suppose so. So you're saying a cheeseburger and not a hamburger sent the president to the United States to the hospital? Yeah, I guess so. I'm, I'm not sure that that's relevant. I'm just trying to get the facts straight. The American people demand to know what's happening. Is there any lettuce or onions on it? I am not at liberty to say at this time. Oh, really? No, I just don't know, and I don't think it's that important. It could be. Yeah, look, uh, can we please move on? Anyhow, uh, early this afternoon, President Eisenhower was golfing when he started to experience some indigestion. He was golfing right after he ate the cheeseburger? Wasn't he supposed to wait 45 minutes before golfing after eating? <laughs> you guys, I, that's a swimming thing, I think. We're getting way off track here. I'm trying to tell y'all and the nation that the president has suffered a heart attack. <gasps> because of the cheeseburger? No, damn it. Move past the burger already. Uh, you brought it up in the first place. All right. I hate my job. Anyway, the president is being cared for in the hospital and his doctors are hopeful he'll make a full recovery. How can they be so hopeful? Well, they're treating him with the newest and best pharmaceuticals. A newer medication has just been developed that should protect the president from further harm to his heart. Is a new medication safe to be used on the leader of the free world? Ah, don't you worry. They're taking every precaution. And to be on the safe side, his doctors are also recommending the finest and smoothest cigarettes to improve his breathing and steady his temperament. That does sound reassuring. Speaking of which, does anyone have a light? Well, it's 1955, so yeah, everybody does. Oh, well, I feel better already. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. That was excellent. Cases through our history, it's just Max in there and Mac and me. You gotta listen, you don't have to read. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, you seem to be making a lot of friends in the podcast of historosphere these days. Would you agree? Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> I it's, mean, I can, I can sound kind of it assume. out. One syllable at a time. Podcasto? No, wait, the syllable? I have to count syllables. Clap it's mouth. like <laughs> podcast. Oh, hist Anywho, gentlemen, we are joined here today by our collaborators, dare I say colleagues, from the Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast. The hosts, Eric and Russ, have joined us today to collaborate on a Wisconsin-based medical history deal, right? So, yeah, gentlemen, we're welcome. Here. Yeah, we're glad to be here. We are. We uh, yeah, hey, we are honestly honored to be in the presence of smarter individuals than, oh, than we agree. are. We're, we're, we're trying our best. <laughs> it's only because Aaron's in the room. Mike and I, I are not changing that average. Right. You know, yeah, any name that starts with, you know, two vowels is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah, hear yeah. something crack in the background. Did you just open, open something? Well, uh, yeah. yeah, so we, uh, in, in true Wisconsin drunken history fashion, uh, we always have a few libations uh, or maybe a few too many. Well, we record, so uh, hey, on this fine day, we are having a few. Nice. It's past nine on a Sunday. You know? Yeah, it's on a Sunday, so I think that is not only reasonable, but expected. There we go. Gentlemen, would you tell our uh, listeners a little bit about your show, kind of what they can expect if going over there, and uh, a little about yourselves, if you don't mind? So we are Eric and, and I'm Russ. Russ. And I'm Russ. 
And we actually did a podcast. Uh, we started a podcast called Wisconsin Drunken History. And the main focus here was to uh, bring a little piece of Wisconsin history and, you know, dive into it a little bit, but then also bring a little bit of uh, the rest of Wisconsin culture in as well. So we do a little bit of uh, beer or, you know, other liquor that's produced here in the state of Wisconsin, uh, as well as a music segment as well in every single episode where we highlight a, a, a Wisconsin-based artist or band, and we play and feature a song in each one of those episodes. And uh, sometimes we have interviews with different breweries or uh, Wisconsin figures if we can. And, uh, and and this honestly all just started over uh, the pandemic where, uh, you know, Russ and I were a little bit bored of sitting at home and, and uh, quarantining. So we got together safely and uh, that was how we passed the time. Yeah. And I mean, we've been friends since high school. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of more from like the Northwood. So there's not a lot to, you know, there's not a lot to really do up there. So a lot of times I'd spend time in the library researching topics. Uh, when I did move down to Elkhorn, I met Eric in school. We've been pretty much buddies ever since. Yeah. And uh, just kind of reporting some of the uh, Wisconsin history I found. And we've always been music lovers. So we just wanted to uh, spotlight some of the most amazing music that comes from the state. Right? Yeah. I mean, you don't get, you don't get the um, exposure you would if you were out in California or like the East coast. Sure. So we're just trying to spread some of this <laughs> Midwest love around and we're doing our part. We're doing our part. There's definitely a lot of love in the Midwest. We all know that. And uh, we did, we reached out to you guys a while ago and uh, Eric and Russ had us on their show and we were able to talk a little bit of medical history, got an introduction. I think that was, was that, Episode 100, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think it was, was our actually, special yeah, episode our 100. Special. And we were special along with it, I hope. <laughs> oh, of course. We were we were like so delighted to be able to have uh, another podcast uh, be featured with us uh, and, and interview you all for uh, our, our special episode 100, kind of that milestone marker. And uh, we were so excited to be able to bring you on. I think we talked about uh, the Bucks. The, the Bucks organization and how they had just won the yeah, championship. Yep. And so it just felt fitting to also bring in uh, a, another really great uh, set of podcasters as well. Yeah. People have always told me I'm special. I'm not, I don't know what they're getting at. <laughs> it's your voice. And I'm really excited to talk about what we're talking about today. Obviously I don't want to do any spoilers, but I am no. a Un university of Wisconsin, Madison alum alumni and uh, one of the best schools in the world, in my opinion. Yeah. So just throwing it out there. Don't get mad. Don't give them a one-star review because I said that because I love that. So. <laughs> Send all your negative reviews to uh, Wisconsin Drunk watch. History. Yeah. And we will <laughs> we will be lo linking all those links on the show notes. And uh, we'll come back and uh, chat about it again at the end. Utterly disappointing. That one was pretty good, though. Yeah. That <laughs> was pretty good review, though. That was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, so you guys are like beer experts. I have a, a beer question because yeah. I, I feel like sours have taken the place of IPAs. And I went to the store the other day and all I saw was sour, sour, sour. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah. Fruited, fruited sours and fruited ales and sours uh, uh, have kind of uh, been a, a new thing. And especially like with the milkshake and adding kind of like that lactose. Mm, feature to it, so I love those. I get I get a little nervous with the sours though, like just having um you know your bacteria your bacteria coming right in yeah. from the air there that natural bacillus if you yeah. will, mm -hmm. um but they're good. I mean I'll I'll be honest, like we've had a couple of goes as recently that I would recommend to anyone. I'm a huge fan of the sours uh, as well. I know so. you are, but I like sours as well. I used to do a bunch of home brewing back in the day, and I remember being in medical school and. One fact that stuck with me and probably replaced a childhood memory or something, that's how it works, was <laughs> that there are no known pathogens that can enter beer. And even if they do, you have to be extremely immunocompromised to even worry about it. So the worst you can do with all the bacteria sitting in there is make it taste gross. That's which good. I definitely did. That's good to know. <laughs> that's good to know, actually, because I was always nervous about it, like leaving an open for fermenter um, because you're getting kind of all your natural bacillus and yeast coming in there. And Wisconsin actually doesn't have the best strains of yeast to be honest. Yeah. I mean, there's been people researching and trying to find old yeast strains uh, from the state. And uh, as doctors, do you guys have any uh, input on that? Any good yeasts we could use? Oh, recommend? we don't know the good yeast. Any no. yeast we know. Yeah, you, 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 you don't, don't want to talk usually, about that yeast. 
Yeah, it's scraped out of people's roles. Oh. <laughs> ER yeast is in not the best case yeast. scenario. That's no. where it comes from. Yeah. That's the beer no one's drinking. So, <laughs> uh, With that mental image uh, left uh, <laughs> blazoned on everybody's mind, I think it's perfect. Let's dive into our main subject. So we're going to start with a little bit of a story. Let's go back to the 1920s. And I picture, if you will, being on the prairies of Canada and North United States. And there are a bunch of cattle dying, and they're dying from internal bleeding, hemorrhaging everywhere. And this seems to only happen when the hay and environment become damp and cold. And what ends up starting out as this curious, my cattle are dying in these circumstances, becomes known as something called a sweet clover disease. It sounds cute, to be honest. It, that sounds like the cutest disease you could get, though. I honest. want to think of a cuter disease name. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm yeah that's cute though, like sweet clover disease. Like, is oh. there another disease that features the word sweet? Uh, oh, yeah, there's, there's, maple, there's maple urine or maple, maple syrup, syrup urine disease. Urine disease. Yeah. Oh, see, no, that oh. is sweeter. That is pretty cool, actually. It's pretty vicious, though. Is it? Oh, God. yeah. No, I know. It's it's oh, how we, it has to do with uh, your inability to process. Uh, Three amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, and uh, what's it, valine. Jeez, your and, Google's fast. Wow. <laughs> Google is fast. <laughs> that is a mnemonic that is burned into my memory for life. And so the folks who have this, they are not able to process those three amino acids. And so they, they end up with a lot of metabolic uh, problems and difficulties. And uh, there we go. I just took step one of the boards again. I, I just I just imagine the c- Canadian farmer though, like, hey, Barb, there's something going on with the cows out there. Get them to the barn, you know. Like, they can just you know, like, this is like my image I got in no. my head. He's like a true Canadian. Yeah, but these are Canadians. I think you just sounded a little bit more like a Burp Uper. And get to the barn. That's I mean, Uper in Canada, close enough. Yeah, close enough. For anybody listening that doesn't know what a Uper is, it's huh. the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Yeah, up in the Ute. Anywho, so uh, there are a couple of veterinarians that start getting interested in this. Uh, a gentleman named uh, Frank Schofield, who was Canadian-based, and then a Lee Roderick, who was a U.S.-based veterinarian. And they kind of, I don't know that they were working together. That wasn't really clear. But they did figure out that this bleeding cows suddenly disease seems to go away when you give a blood transfusion. So it piqued some curiosity. Now, let's go to Wisconsin, because that's where we are. And that's where all the best medical history is found. So. 1933, Ed Carlson, which is one of the most Wisconsin names ever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He finds that he has a cow that's dying, and he says, I'm going to go to the University of Wisconsin, try to figure out what's going on. So he takes the cow, he loads it into a vehicle, drives like 200 miles from where he is, and so happens to run into a biochemist named Carl Link. He brings with him the cow, which is now deceased, and a bunch of half-rotted hay from his farm, and then a milk jug of unclotted blood, because the blood is not congealing. So that's pretty gross, right? (laughs) Yeah. Not not cool. (laughs) Those giant old metal dairy cans. That's what I see, too. It's exactly what I pictured. So he goes in, and Dr. Link here is a biochemist, and so he's, I can only imagine this guy walking in like, hey, I got this dead cow, a bunch of blood that won't clot, and uh, this rotten hay. Do you, what do you think is going on? The biochemist is like, well, I'm not a vet, so I think this is sweet clover disease. And the farmer says, no, I think there's something here. I think we, you, you should investigate it. He's been feeding this, his cows the same hay for years, so he's wondering, and I think reasonably, right, why is this now a problem? So the biochemist Link, he's not totally convinced this is something worth pursuing, but uh, a student later <laughs> apparently comes up to him. He's like, he, the student kept the bucket of blood, the rotten hay. It doesn't say what he did with the cow, but he basically says, hey, look, we got to help this guy. There's, there's, there might be something here. It's a great discussion. Hey, uh, are, are you going to do anything with that giant bucket of blood? I yeah, was yeah, right. Are you going to finish that? <laughs> <laughs> Can we science on this a little bit at least? <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about uh, old Carl Paul Link, that biochemist. They described him in an article I found as a lively and restless personality. I think I can relate to this. I don't know about you guys. Oh, yeah. (laughs) No denying that. Absolutely. I think that's one of the best personalities you can have. He studied in Scotland, Austria, and Switzerland under a bunch of Nobel Prize winning tutors before he ended up at the University of Wisconsin. He's a biochemistry professor, you know, as you do. Austria. Put another shrimp on the barbie, mate. (laughs) 
<laughs> this is like is this like pre jump around University of Wisconsin too, right? Like yeah. I don't think Carl Link was participating in that, do you think? No. You don't think so? I don't think nature the song wasn't was even out. around. <laughs> they probably had something else that they did. Yeah. <laughs> he uh and then so yeah, while he's there, he studies agricultural chemistry, which is maybe one of the least exciting sounding branches of chemistry, I'm guessing. Not a lot of explosions in agricultural chemistry, I would imagine. <laughs> Not a yeah. lot. It sounds like there's probably a lot. Actually, you're probably right. I will say, yeah. uh, gentlemen, the uh, if you want one of the best chapters in any emergency medicine textbook to go look at, look at farm injuries. Hmm. Oh, yeah. I those are, those are brutal. I've already <laughs> seen one. My dad lost his toes. <laughs> farm- oh, geez. Yeah. It's, it, it just, it never, it, it's always the most heinous gigantic equipment causing injuries and so but they almost always walk away from that stuff those yeah. farmers like yeah and they're farmers so they come in four farmer. days later they're like yeah. well i had trouble pulling my field with one yeah. arm so i <laughs> thought i should get it checked out it's so true it's not even an exaggeration either so the the question here is is you're trying to figure out you know blood usually clots if uh, if you've ever had the pleasure of leaking a bunch of blood onto the floor and i know everybody has that experience put about a cup or two of blood on the floor and see what happens to it. Have, have uh, you guys over there ever done this? Uh, no, I can't say that I have, so I cannot confirm. If you play this podcast backwards, it tells you to put a cup of blood on the floor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> put a cup of blood on the floor. Yeah. Is this podcast also a Beatles record? Perfect <laughs> record. Blood on the floor. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Okay. So... I'm going to have, you know, let's have Aaron just recount all the steps in the clotting cascade for why no, blood sure. becomes a jelly. <laughs> so Aaron, go ahead. Becomes a jelly. <laughs> no, no, I'm not no. doing that. Oh my not, God. It's not your really grandma who's Google. making preservatives, okay? Yeah, it's not Bill Cosby uh, Jello commercial here. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> yeah. He had to go there. He went there. Uh, he had to go I, there. He went with the Cos. He went with the Cosby sweater. <laughs> we went with the the sweet clover hay, and now we're talking about Bill Cosby. I'm getting nervous. <laughs> when Cos comes in, you got a problem going on in your pocket. <laughs> Everybody sits up a little bit and yeah. starts sweating. So, yeah, okay. The clotting of blood is a pretty complicated thing that you remember all the details of in medical school for a certain period of time. And then unless it's relevant to your career as a hematologist, you, they, they just sort of start fading in the background. But... Blood clots. So if you pour it out on the ground, it will form these big jelly clots. And that's a natural thing. That's sort of a way we stop ourselves from bleeding, right? So it's generally a good thing, but this blood was not clotting. So in 1939, Link and his colleagues basically found this natural substance. Dicumarin was being created by an oxidative process. Uh, Aaron, again, oxidation? Uh, Oxidation, I lose. Reduction, I gain electrons. So oxidation reactions are... Losing electrons? I didn't actually expect him to respond. <laughs> no, that was funny. <laughs> Rust. <laughs> Rust. Yes. We love organic chemistry jokes. <laughs> Anywho. Well, you so, got to tell them from two points of view. I mean, there's chirality. Oh, my God. <laughs> Moving on from that. <laughs> Sharing. Oh, pushing electrons. I got the book right here. Pushing electrons. <laughs> So <laughs> can we cut yeah. this part out? Nobody's no, everybody get it. loves chemistry jokes. Come on. We totally the, get them. The work uh, that was being done there was being funded by the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, abbreviated WARF, W-A-R-F, and they got the patent for dicumerol in 1941. But at the same time, and very fortuitous, they also, and by they, uh, these are different researchers than Dr. Link, they discover something called vitamin K. I don't know if a lot of folks learn about vitamin K. Eric Russ, have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah, actually, uh, when my son was born, he had a lot of uh, bilirubin. Um, so we had to get a lamp and uh, vitamin K was the one thing that pretty much every doctor recommended. So mm-hmm. we went to um, a chemist who was actually going to synthesize us for us, which was going to cost us 1500 bucks. But I actually found a source at UW-Madison where they made uh, vitamin K. So I researched it quite a bit. Pretty interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. It's one of it's so it's not a vitamin that gets talked about a lot in outside of these sort of circles, but yeah, it's a vitamin that's important for helping blood clot safely and uh and if there's liver dysfunction going on, you worry about that. So that would be the link there. 
around this time that they're sort of playing around with this not clotting blood and, and figuring out this substance is in there that's making it maybe not clot, vitamin K has been discovered and Link's lab also somehow, I don't know how this happens, but they found out that the vitamin K seemed to counteract the effects of that dicumerol or make the blood not clot substance. So that's going to be important later. That's some foreshadowing for you. So the first uses of this stuff, you know, uh, this this rotten hay produced substance is, hey, it's pretty good at killing animals. So maybe let's uh, let's use it for that, right? In 1945, Link has a recurrence of tuberculosis, as you do, and it leaves him basically bedbound for like eight months. Let's be happy to live in the age of oh, yeah. antibiotics. Yeah, where we don't have to worry about TB. Absolutely. I've, as long as you don't I, go to a Russian prison. That's fair. Or anywhere I've else seen in the world. i cases of it in, <laughs> in practice. So it's still around. It's still around. But uh, while he's basically in his bed, uh, Link actually wrote, quote, rather than vegetate like a topped carrot, he read up on the history of rodent control from ancient to modern times, as you do. <laughs> Sounds like a good one. I might have to get that from my library. I don't know. I'm, just I'm sure you, I, I have it on the shelf behind me if you want to borrow oh, it. Oh, wow. Okay. That sounds like a great book. The signed edition. So t- the substance, dicumerol, that what he found, was actually too slow to be a poison. It took a while to actually start working once you gave it, and so it probably wasn't the answer. And, you know, what, what do scientists do when they find a potential poison? Try to find the better poison, right? So Link and his colleagues go through 150 variations of the coumarin or dicumarol molecule. And what do you know? A, a number 42 that they isolated was the most potent, meaning 42 is truly the answer to everything. Of oh. course. Yeah. I thought it was it's, me. Uh, honestly, it's gotten me this no. far in life so far. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I th- and Mike, clearly, when in doubt, Charlie out. Everybody knows that. Mm-hmm. It's either B or C. It could be one of those. Uh, so at this point... They name it Warfarin, paying homage to the funding agency, that Wisconsin uh, agency we talked about. And so therefore, every time you hear this medication, Warfarin, Wisconsin is literally part of the namesake of this drug. Now, uh, Eric and Russ, have you guys ever heard of this medicine? I don't know if it's come across your... Yeah, I sure have. Uh, uh, You know, it's a a pretty well-known thing, I think, with... uh, it, it's a blood thinner. Is that is that correct? Mm-hmm. You got it. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it a bit more. But it, it's one of these medicines that is very much still a part of what we do today. Huge, and yeah. we definitely have Wisconsin to thank for it. We may say, and I don't know if this will come up, but it's one of those things. So it, it, a lot of times as doctors, we we interchange names. So we'll sometimes say Coumadin or Warfarin or whatnot. And one of them is a generic name and one of them is a trade name. But for this uh, this show, they are the same medication. Coumadin equals Warfarin, just so. Hey, Max, I, I, that up. I honestly don't know which one's the generic and which one's the trade name. I had to look it up, so don't feel yeah, bad. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, well, which one's it, which? I know. I was like, oh, wait, which way is it going? Yeah, Warfarin's the trade name, right? Yeah, Warfarin's the trade name. Because Warfarin has the Warf in it. Yes, correct. In 1948, it's once they isolated the Warfarin, it gets marketed as a rodenticide. So give it to the rodents, and uh, they hemorrhage out. And I, I, as a total animal person, I, I don't know if that's more or less cute than the cows. Rats? Less cute. Oh, my God, it's not even close. Cows are super cute. They're, like, adorable. They'll come up. they got the big cow eyes. Eric and Russ, which one is cuter? Uh, I have to say the cows. They're pretty cute. They got the big eyelashes. They, they're yeah. kind of dumb, but they're like really their eyes at you? Like, Yeah. Mm, okay. Are, are you a fan of cows or are you like rodents? Oh, I, cows over rodents all day. All right. <laughs> yeah. Is there a more Wisconsin answer than that? <laughs> well, this is the end of this episode. I am storming off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, Bye, I, buddy. Yeah. Rats are so <laughs> smart. They're so smart. Well, and, and they're used for a lot of very uh, test-worthy things, right? Uh, but cows, I mean, they're just cute. I was actually just reading something pretty interesting about cows. Um, cow, is it colostrum? Is that how you say it? Mm. It would be like the milk mm-hmm. substance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've actually heard some really good research with uh, the cow stuff coming up. I, colostrum? I mean, yeah, actually, uh, there was something um, for treating certain diseases and like um, issues with like autoimmune disease and stuff. Pretty interesting. To be honest, I would have to look. At, yeah, that that does sound interesting. There's all kinds of interesting People connections between stuff. childhood exposures yeah. and like whether yeah. asthma yeah. develops and everything. So sure, if you get yeah. achy joints, get it, get the first couple of draws off the udder. <laughs> yeah, just go right on in. Like you guys on, could have the rest. That's the all you needed. That's fine. <laughs> we don't have a cow. We have a bull. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> name that movie. 
I, I can't, but it's funny. <laughs> oh, it's, that's one of the greatest movies ever made, Kingpin. Oh, oh that's such God, a good movie. yes. Oh, I will, I will die on that hill. That's one of the greatest oh, Woody underrated comedies. So ever. great. I feel dumb. A little no. weird story about uh, Woody Harrelson. Do you guys know his dad was like a convicted felon? What? No, no I don't know this. He was actually so he was uh, he was on the FBI's most wanted list for a long time. Oh my gosh, wow. that's spicy. I just read this about Woody Harrelson. Violent, I didn't know, like his dad is her. Yeah, whimsical. Yeah, he like left his kid when he was young, but he was like on the road committing a whole bunch of heinous crimes, and the FBI was like looking for him. Kingpin is right up there with uh, Big Lebowski. I mean, yeah, those are classic. Those are those oh, are yeah. two of literally the best movies made cult movies anything with chris farley too though to be honest yeah that's true very wisconsin all right yeah i don't disagree with any of that and i don't think it's i don't think it's pronounced heinous i think it's anus the age is oh the age is anus crimes that's a special victims unit thing you know i actually do think that's a reasonable segue back uh because we got we're going to go to a little bit of a dark beginning to the use of this medication in humans it's not unsurprising that they looked at this medicine and said maybe there's a use for it, but it actually doesn't happen until 1951. And on the heels of an army inductee who unfortunately tries to commit suicide by taking a bunch of this warfarin rodent, a rodenticide. So he takes a bunch of it trying to end his life. And in the hospital, they say, well, we'll just treat you with vitamin K and it, it works. It stops the warfarin from causing harm. And at this point, it opens up the door to saying, hey, maybe we can use this and safely in people because, well, we have a we have a reversal agent. Right. And so when it, the FDA approves warfarin for use in humans to treat blood clots in 1954. Now, the available anticoagulants, meaning blood thinning agents at that time, uh, were mostly something called heparin, which is definitely still used today. But it's only an injectable kind of goes into an IV through a drip kind of thing. It doesn't really come in pill form. And uh, there was an oral form, like a pill form of the uh, dicumerol, that substance they isolated from the hay. But as I said, it takes forever and it doesn't really work all that well. The flip side is that warfarin, when you take it, has what we call high bioavailability. Meaning what, Aaron? It gets absorbed very well, looks like in the notes. That's yeah. what I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> spontaneous. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, did you just come up with that yourself? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's from a mnemonic. <laughs> oh, my God. Giant mnemonic, also one of my favorite movies. It's love, really bad. Oh, oh, he goes, it looks like here from the notes that I have in front of me. <laughs> half, half knowledge and half knowing exactly when to BS and say the right thing in the circle. That's this is story. absolutely the best. <laughs> Just like a lot of modern wrestlers, Aaron is taking down the fourth wall. That's right. You're, yeah. Why, Max? Why? <laughs> So no, Eric and Russ, uh, it was very Mike has a problem with me making a lot of wrestling references, oh, and oh. I, I refuse to stop because wrestling is amazing. Here's the thing: if you if you listen to any number of our episodes, we are huge we, fans. We reference WWE and, and WWF, uh, and WWF weird kids. so much. Well, gentlemen, I, I am aware. I have heard. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no pandas on those t-shirts though. This is before the pandas yeah, this were on is, those this WWF is, shirts. Yeah, this is before I have the that shirt. Part. I so have that shirt. You had, oh, nice! You got that shirt. I, I love I love everything wrestling, so I absolutely appreciate what you just did there. I thought you would. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Yes, <laughs> Mike. I don't think there's any reason to doubt that FDR is the greatest tag team in the last twenty years. But oh, that being said. Yeah. All yeah. right, we're moving FDR. on. Mike. <laughs> what do you mean? So, <laughs> I'm going to do so many edits. So you know what? They could have called them the Tennessee Authority. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Coming in. That'd be a great historical wrestling Wouldn't name. And oh. I don't even watch wrestling, but yeah. Tennessee that's, Authority I'm working, elbow drive. I'm working on changing that. Um, <laughs> so. High bioavailability, that's right. So you take a pill of warfarin, and a lot of it gets absorbed, meaning you get a lot of the benefit of the medication, and hey, it can be turned off, as we said, so it's all good stuff. The funny thing is, all of this that we're talking about is happening in the 50s, mid-50s. The actual way that Coumadin or warfarin works was not really discovered until 1978, so they didn't really exactly know how this worked, but they knew it did work. It's a lot of medicines like that. I don't know if that makes anybody feel better or worse. Worse. We still don't know how Tylenol exactly works. True story. Really? We think, I mean, there's, there's, we think it works on the brain to like kind of decrease pain signals, but it's exact kind of mechanism of how it does that. Not totally well understood. That's really interesting. Hmm. Right? So 
basically Warfarin seems to be having some promising uses. And so what it really needs at this point is a celebrity endorsement. And Dwight D. Eisenhower steps in. You may have heard of him, one of those presidents. I don't remember which one. I should have looked it up. I don't remember what number he was. Do you know off the top of your head, Aaron? Nope, I don't. It was 69, I think. 30. 30. <laughs> 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 We're on like 40. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. President number 33, I think. Uh, <laughs> you just throw this out? No, it. Do you know 30, this? No, that's, oh. Wow, that's really close. 34th, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right. That's I was just trying to make another joke wow. with the 33 thing because that's you, 69 and 33 are those numbers that do the thing with the. Uh-huh. I, I didn't get that. I don't. Anyway, I'm, I'm very <laughs> sheltered. Right. So. But anyway, uh, 34. Yeah. Giannis okay. Antetokounmpo. So, you know, uh, nice. Going back to wrestling here, do you guys think Dwight D. Eisenhower would have been pretty sweet? D.D. Eisenhower or DDP? You know, like Darren Dallas Page, but Dwight D. Yeah. D.D. He's, it's right there. Like, it's just <sighs> waiting for a wrestling. Well, no, didn't he have a nickname, though? Wasn't he the, the Duke or wasn't he something? Uh, he oh, did. Yeah, Duke. yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, I don't remember if it was the Duke or what, but yeah, um, absolutely. Or No, it was Ike, right? No. Yeah, yeah. Ike was a nickname of his. I'm seeing if he has other ones. Ike when he was a general. General, yeah. general Ike. Ike Driver? He could have actually taken, I am a real emerge. Ah. Oh, he totally he could. Have could. That and like totally came in with gen- the general. Yeah. Oh, he would have, oh, man, who would be That would have been Norman Schwarzkopf, though. Here you go. So apparently oh, yeah. his, his, his name was Norman. His nickname was Little Icky when he was a kid. Little Icky. Ooh. Oh, God. He may want to retool oh, that for the ring. <laughs> Little Icky. That's part of the public record. No. You I'm think he would have had that scrub? His finisher would be. That's actually on his little wiki page. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so bad. I'm sorry. I love it's, it. That, was um, awesome. that joke is too G-rated for this show. We're going to have to cut yeah, it. I'm sorry. just. I'm little, just... little wiki. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, right. I'm going to go ahead and sign off now. <laughs> <laughs> yourself out <laughs> little, little wiki is eric's rap name i think though yeah. <laughs> to be honest. oh i've been down that rabbit hole too so dwight d eisenhower has a presidential heart attack this is on september 23rd 1955 he's out for a round of golf do you guys know where he was playing golf uh no the golf course <laughs> uh, a nice little par three um <laughs> mini golf what is what is like the overall theme like of this show oh, today? Hey, oh no way! It's a Wisconsin course. Oh, oh, is he playing at the actual course on Wisconsin? Don't uh, tell me Elkhorn. Badger? Don't tell me Elkhorn Evergreen. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he was playing in Denver. I just before. wanted to build a <laughs> suspense on that one. Mile sure. High Stadium. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's not saying nothing to do with Wisconsin. He was just Sorry. smashing <laughs> golf balls into the outfield. <laughs> you know it. So he's uh, so he's playing. A, I know that he he was doing that in Denver, At but golf. he starts having some uh, chest discomfort, and uh, he thinks it's probably the hamburger he had for lunch. This indigestion, as he put it, uh, continues, and it wakes him up that night at like two in the morning. And so they call for his personal physician, who arrives about an hour later at three in the morning, and uh, treats him with some morphine for his indigestion. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> I just as sleep, we are. Dwight, sleep. <laughs> Sounds like Michael Jackson's doctor. That's medicine of the fifties is the best. That's an overnight call medicine if I've ever heard one. You're like you're, <laughs> it's three in the morning here. Let's give you some morphine. I think he just needs some methamphetamine. <laughs> he went uh, from hard and like real fast. He's like, just give me some morphine. We're going all the way to the top right away. Yeah. So <laughs> it's uh, it was a better time. No, it wasn't. But. <laughs> So he, he he manages to somehow get to sleep with the morphine, I guess. And the next day, he's a little groggy, a little tired, you know, takes a nap. And then the doc's like, you know, maybe I'm going to check an EKG on him. You know, put some stickers on him and see what that heart electrical rhythm is doing. And what do you know? He's having, he's having an extensive anterior heart attack, meaning the front of his heart, you can see it on the tracing, is suffering from lack of blood flow. And that's a problem. But, you know, sure, his doctor may have missed that diagnosis on the first go around, but that's probably because he was just too busy enjoying a nice cigarette. He's one of the busiest men in town. While his door may say office hours two to four, he's actually on call 24 hours a day. The doctor is a scientist, a diplomat, and a friendly, sympathetic human being all in one, no matter how long and hard his schedule. According to a recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. 
Doctors in every branch of medicine, 113, 597 in all, were queried in this nationwide study of cigarette preference. Three leading research organizations made the survey. The gist of the query was, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Kim. The rich, full flavor and cool mildness of Camel's superb blend of costlier tobaccos seem to have the same appeal to the smoking tastes of doctors as to millions of other smokers. If you are a Camel smoker, this preference among doctors will hardly surprise you. If you're not, well, try Camel's now. Camel's. Costlier tobaccos. Your T-Zone will tell you. T is for taste. T is for throat. That's a real ad. <laughs> God. That's... I actually just went out and, and uh, got myself a pack. <laughs> you went and got the missile while we, were, did, yeah. while we were on that commercial break. Oh, camels? Yeah. Yep. Oh, man. Old school. How much? How many camel camel bucks or camel cash do you have? I got a how lot of camel, camel points for that. Joe yeah. Cool over here. I If you could put down a down payment on a house with camel cash, that would be the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> I don't think I saw that in the catalog. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got a really nice duffel bag. I and got some that was decent about sweatpants. It. It's about all <laughs> sweatpants. Did they come uh, with the burn holes in them, or did you have Those... to drop some camel in there? <laughs> you want to know what? They can't hold up to camel ash. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> they should be taken out of that catalog. <laughs> Sorry. Leave a one-star review somewhere on the internet. Yeah. Camel duffel bag sucks. Done. <laughs> Still, still back on the office hours, two to four. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not bad. Oh, that's, that's so nice. Oh God, I should have become a doctor. You guys really work those hours? <laughs> no, like the same hours that the DMV has. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you just missed us. We're on lunch now, and then we're gonna be just go gone on. in a minute. So <laughs> yeah, but we'll leave, some, we'll leave some morphine in the tray for you. Just nine to one thirty. He's posing for these portraits though, because he had to paint that. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> absolutely blasting a dart while he's in the office. <laughs> nice. Oh, this is Look at that uh flat top he's got. Nice little poofy. Dude, my pop. dad my dad was a uh, he he graduated uh medical school in the 70s. He was like, "Yep, yeah, we used to smoke in the, the hospital. We used to like go to the break room and smoke all the time." Gross. <laughs> yeah. They did that I in actually, the early 2000s still. When we were I was in- just going to say too, I had a job at a call center in Whitewater, Wisconsin while I was uh at UW Dub and one of the rooms was actually a smoking break room inside of the call center mm. Mm. and the walls were disgusting. <laughs> it's, I'm sure the ventilation was awesome. Oh God. Great. You might, you might <laughs> smoke Top at that notch, point, mostly. right? Like it's just going right up into the vent shaft. Everyone's yeah. smoking in the office of that. You point, don't even so. have to smoke. You just walk up to the wall, take a nice little lick. <laughs> oh God. Um, oh, you've got you enough. You gotta go there. Might be safer. Yeah. It probably well, will be. Yeah, probably a give and take to be honest. <laughs> The new nicotine flavored Gatorade. <laughs> Electrolytes. You need a spit bottle that your buddy you choose left over in your car. Oh, oh yeah. don't. I'm going to barf. You can make Mike barf if you say enough gross stuff. True story. Oh, it's like every bubbler in high school. You went to go to get a drink and it was wintergreen flavored water. <laughs> you guys, do you guys remember that Simpsons episode, Tomacco, where they mixed tomatoes and tobacco together? Oh, no. <laughs> you don't remember that? I do no. a little bit. Is it an older one? Yeah, it is. But like, who's who's gonna make that hybrid? Because I like, I probably eat it. To be honest. I'm more worried. About <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna throw it out there. So, I mean, from everything we just said, I think it must have been really fun to be a doctor in the 1940s. You know, you just recommend smoking and drinking, and those are ways to get to better health. And none of that diet and exercise nonsense. That's all boring anyway. So. <laughs> With that, we were we were talking about Eisenhower and his uh, and how this relates to Warfarin and him having a heart attack. So he goes into the hospital. Nineteen. This is hospitalization for a heart attack. Nineteen fifties edition. They start him out by putting him in an oxygen tent, which is, I, I assume, just a tent full of a lot of oxygen. I don't. Right. Seems safe. No. Don't <laughs> smoke that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't definitely <laughs> light up a camel in that tent. Gee whiz. So here is the actual things that apparently they treated him with. And Mike and Aaron, I think you guys will agree this is excellent. Morphine for pain, right? Can't go wrong there. Mm-hmm. Pa- paparin, paparin, Nailed it. Paparin. Paparin. I think that there we go. been in some of the textbooks when I was in medical school. I can imagine, right next <laughs> to Pertilium. 
It's a, that's a coronary uh, antispasmodic. Uh, and they also gave him atropine, which is a way that we usually, it's a medicine we will use under like dire circumstances to speed up our heart rate because it's going dangerously slow. And there's some other actually poisons we use it for, but they were just giving it to him to prevent his heart from going into an abnormal rhythm, which is pretty funny because atropine can definitely make your heart go into abnormal rhythms by itself. But if you look at order sets, not admitted patients is always in as a PRN. <laughs> PRN being a medicine you should use under certain circumstances, not just because. Mm. So they also use both heparin and coumadin, which is fun. Just I mean, why not? Right? If a little bit's good, then more is better. That's President, let's make his blood really thin. So like the United States went zero to 100 for DDE. Always. They went zero to 100. Like, yeah. just so what, oh, like let's, give, let's give them the max dose. Morphine and then two of the possible. drugs that do the exact same thing to really get it going. Oh, yep. yeah. Yep. And also, let's speed this baby up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. let's throw them in a uh, 100% nailed what they were doing <laughs> so, so. <laughs> exactly I mean the morphine these would have let's, the morphine is still approved right you still use morphine for, for people in, in heart cases so, right. so like got contrast, one of the four right yeah, well, and I, I was even like, let's contrast what we would do today. So Eisenhower comes into the ER. We do yeah, we use some morphine for, for pain, but mm -hmm. we use other medicines that are called nitrites, which kind of have the same What's effect of papaverin. Thank you. And But here we have like interventional cardiology where they can, you know, use an x-ray and go in your artery in your leg or your wrist, out. and they can just uh, yeah suck the clot out or open the artery that's narrowed by putting a stent in there. And, and so nowadays... We do a lot better. In fact, back in the time of Eisenhower's heart attack, the mortality, like patients who died, who made it to the hospital with this condition was 30 to 40%. Oh, it's rough. So kind of a big deal, right, that he was having a heart attack. And actually, this sort of is a historical little bit of a tangent. It, it was a, There was a lot of discussion among his staff, apparently, and his press secretary as like, what should we share? Because in the days before him, the good old Woodrow Wilson and FDR days, it was, no, we hide the medical problems so that uh, we keep this image of the president as, you know, just robust uh, health. And so they actually decided, you know what, we're going to be candid. We're going to talk about this. That's crazy. Yeah. It was a very different, you know, it was a different time. Now, so, the, now the president falls sideways off his bike because he can't get his foot out of the clip. And I, I've seen that. <laughs> no, but, they, but they do it too. Like, they're like, all right, videotape me running across this grassy hill. They're like, look how, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look yeah, how totally. energetic I am. No, 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 you look like a dick shit. That's how we, that's how we counter it, running like, across all. the hill. Here's this guy. He's totally in perfect health. He might have fallen off his bike yesterday. But he's going to run across some stuff now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at him go. <laughs> it's, uh, it's everything is image, man. So the uh, the other problem here is like Ike's up for like re-election soon. So it's sort of, a you know, what is he going to be able to do that? Is he going to survive this? And so there was some legit public panic, uh, you know, because heart attacks did carry this high mortality rate. And, and, and actually around this time heart disease is kind of overtaking the old standbys of infectious disease and uh, you know, dying in military affairs. So people are kind of becoming wise to it. Now, they haven't really associated it with all the cigarette smoking at the time or a lot of the, you know, just eating steak three meals a day, but it's becoming a big problem or at least weighing on the public consciousness. They use this as a bit of a teaching moment so that by being open about the president's health, they kind of start talking about, well, he had a heart attack and we think these are the causes and the risks, et cetera. So it actually kind of leads to a nice teachable moment for the American public. The other part of this is warfarin, which was used on the president. It's good enough for the president. It's good enough for everybody else. And it starts becoming a go-to medication for not only blood clots, but also heart conditions and things like that. And this continues to this day. In 2019, warfarin was the 50th most prescribed medicine in the U.S., like 14 million doses given. The World Health Organization says it's one of it's like one of the most essential medicines to keep on hand, and it's cheap. You can turn it off if it's causing problems, and it's got its own pains. I mean, you have to like check blood levels to see how thin they are. It can be the the medicine can be affected by diet and things like that. But we use it for atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal heart rhythm. We use it for um, if you have a blood clot, and we also use it if they've put in a new heart valve for you that's mechanical. So warfarin is very much still a medication we use today, and that's uh, how Wisconsin has contributed through its scientific 
prowess through Dr. Link way back when, when they isolated the substance and turned a dead cow, a pile of rotten hay, and a bucket of blood into an incredible and still useful medication. Good enough for the former president. Good enough for us. How about how about them connected dots? You know what? This story was amazing. I do have to, I love that you, in your notes you have a fib, which is like a completely different term in the uh, medical. Which <laughs> 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 I was laughing so hard. I'm like, a fib. Holy <laughs> smokes, they're going there. If you make somebody hemorrhage, they stop lying to you. <laughs> yeah. I don't um, even think about that. It's so, it's sometimes we have to catch ourselves because yeah, we will yeah. use terminology. We just don't. It becomes so much part and parcel of what we do every day. No, yeah. sure. Did you think that fib stood for lie? I no, I think it's probably Illinois. Friendly, friendly yeah. Illinois brother. Oh, yes. yeah. 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 Friendly <laughs> Illinois brother. Yes. Yeah, there you brother. go. <laughs> How you treat people for, from for those Illinois. of you outside of Wisconsin, a fib is a term for a person from Illinois that is acting like a person from Illinois. <laughs> oh, you just alienated you can't help it. You can't help oh. people. We do have some Chicago listeners. Apologies. Oh, I went sorry. to school in Chicago and I still stand by the statement. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry brother. brother. Sorry, bud. <laughs> sorry, pal. <laughs> well, with that, I think that is all we have time for today. So many thanks to our friends, Eric and Russ, at the Wisconsin Drunken History Podcast. Gentlemen, where can uh, listeners come find you? Uh, where can they get more information about your show? Uh, give us all the deets. Yeah, so I'd say the best place to find all of that information and all of those answers is our website, wisconsindrunkenhistory.com. Uh, you can find the links to our our Instagram, Facebook. You can find episodes. You can find links to our Patreon and everything uh, directly through that. Yeah, and you can find us on all the major uh, podcast platforms. And uh, we're super happy to be here today. And like, this is just a huge honor to be talking to people smarter than us. A lot and, like, of fun. It was a lot of fun. And thank you guys so much for having us on today. Dude, we had a blast as well. And that honor only goes to Aaron because we... Did, we all pale in his. You guys can't decide what to make me. I have a murder basement, and I'm supposedly that. Well, maybe murder it all basement. goes together. I don't know. <laughs> well, have you been caught with your murder basement? If not, then you are definitely no, the smartest. No, I still haven't been caught. So the joke here in Wisconsin: if you got two freezers in the basement, you're just trying to Ed gain some space. So <laughs> what do you got going on down there? So. Serial killer puns never oh, go out of style. <laughs> no, it's been awesome, guys. Really appreciate it. We will definitely link all the uh, stuff to your show in the show notes of this episode. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Oh, you betcha. You let us know if you want us to crash a show again. All right. Yes. Anytime. Likewise. So with that, we appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you will find links to our social media sites. We take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and we work to respond to all posts in our various social media accounts. If you have time, please go and leave us a nice five-star review on iTunes or whichever platform you choose. And if you're old-fashioned, look for us in your favorite AOL chat room. Man, those were a thing once. I still have like a thousand free hours on Disney somewhere. <laughs> Any uh, one-star reviews from this episode, send over to WDH. Yeah. Because we, are... <laughs> we, we, will accept, we will accept the bad reviews. They will accept the good ones. They will get a new utterly disappointing one. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent service. I, you guys can be on anytime. <laughs> with, with that, until next time. Wait a second, Max. It may be the... Uh... <laughs> the guests can sign us out. Oh, excellent. What do you, you guys want? Maybe Mike won't interrupt you. Do it. You got this. Do what? Signing off. Until next time, the poor historians are signing out AMA. Hmm. <laughs> So here That's we true. will, what will happen on the show once it's produced, we will have a sound where our, our, our computer that uh, is in the room with us and is our time portal, which is why we can actually see these skits, um, it will kick on and make a noise. And Beep so, boop. and if you guys want, I, I'll, I'll put the computer noise in here. We love when guests react to how cool our computer is and how ready. the time portal is. Beep boop. <laughs> hang on. You don't get hang on. Hang was, on. That the, was that the sick computer noise? I think I just made. <laughs> I think I just made that computer noise like two seconds before you. You were, you were waiting for me to put in a real one. Sorry, that was going to be done an after. I didn't oh. realize it was actually. Like an you art didn't know that sound effect you made. Yeah. Beep boop. I didn't beep, realize. Beep, beep. Yeah. <laughs> actually, a funny story about UW Madison is uh, in chemistry. I was like, 
you know what? I'm doing this. So I ended up taking some ethyl drinking alcohol. It was just like 99.9% pure. Sure. And I took it from the chemistry lab at UW Madison. Sorry, UW. Like it's, I think it's past the crime limit here. Yeah, statute of limitations. And then, and then, I, of limitations and then I took like it back years. to the dorm and put high C in it and uh, Hawaiian punch. And you should have seen how many kids were lit off from that. It was Isn't that just called? That's just called uh, jungle juice. It's WAP, right? It, yeah, it was. It was full blown, like ninety nine point nine percent alcohol, though. Oh, like, yeah. It was like it was a pure, like synthesized ethyl drinking alcohol. Wait a second, is that in the notes? No. You do medicine. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, They're no. going to take your degree away. Don't say that. No, I'm just kidding. Don't say that. No, that's called a oh, certificate. Yeah. It's a minor. If you actually, yeah, you get an extra minor if you're able to. Oh, cool. Oh. In other sciences. <laughs> science of other. In special science. Thanks, bud. Gee whiz. I'm sorry that this episode is going to just be a horrible edit for you. Don't get these guys one star. <laughs> no, no, this isn't that bad. Yeah. Okay. No, I actually, yeah, you, you guys are, usually it's me just cutting out stuff that Mike says that's really boring. That's outtakes, so. too. Mm-hmm. No, it's yeah, pretty... I mean, outtakes fodder. The poor historians are signing out AMA. Excellent. You guys know what that means? Just curious. Nope. <laughs> yeah, again, it's not a good advice. It's, it's what happens when patients are like, I'm leaving. And you're like, oh, well, okay. You should. Oh, I, would, I would advise I that you stay. stay in the hospital and they, they disagree. Against medical advice, yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah. I knew oh, it. Nice. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah.